listening to the Carleton Political Science Podcast, brought to you by the Department of Political Science at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I'm also for me, one of the PhD students with the program. By sway, sanction, and even violence, democracy has become the standard to which political power is legitimized and contested in the world today. At the same time, while democracy may be viewed by many as the most legit of regime types, the state of democracy in 2020 is not quite so secure. Across the world, traditionally stable democracies face crises of participation, and the tide of exclusionary populism sweeping across the Western world would seem to indicate a potential impasse for liberal democracy and its central norms of peace, order, and good government. As the United States prepares for a presidential campaign trail like none before, and COVID-19 heralds fear of democratic backslide throughout the global south, I spoke with Ali Eliassi about the theoretical state of democracy in the world today. Ali is a PhD student with the Department of Political Science, specializing in ancient political theory and international relations. Ali, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Asif. I would like to extend my sincere condolences to anybody who has lost a loved one or has been affected dramatically by the pandemic. And I would like them to know that despite not knowing each other, I hope they get through this okay. And to all the students who are starting their semester in whatever school they are, I hope and I wish them success. And I know and I want them to know that there are a group of faculty and administrative people who are tirelessly working to ensure that their school year and school semester is going as smoothly as humanly possible considering the current circumstances. I hope they abide by the social distancing laws and wear their mask appropriately. Thanks, man. Now, this is a remarkable time. And, you know, for us all, we're adjusting to it. And even, you know, normally you and I would be doing this podcast in the same room. You know, we're miles apart right now. And it's it's strange. And, you know, it's it's a hard thing to try and get our footing in and try and be academics through through what we're facing right now. So I thank you for taking the time to do this. But, you know, we're here to talk about democracy, the state of democracy, because it's it's an interesting year for that. There's There's a lot of good. There's a lot of stuff to be worried about as well. It's a big election year in the U.S. You know, one thing, and it's a quote that I've always loved, I have no idea to who to do the attribution to, but it's that there is no such thing as democratic theory, but a series of democratic theories. And you know, all of them, going back even to ancient Athens and the oration of Pericles, it's all been about this attempt to grasp the best practice of rule. Now, we live in a very different time than Pericles, obviously, but... Uh, you know, the questions of democratic practice, how are they the same or how are they different between now and then? So in order to look to democratic theories, we have to first understand how democracy itself was conceptualized. And going back to ancient Athens seems very appropriate. But perhaps we should look to the differences from there to now and how it has changed the regime itself. Furthermore, we have to probably look at the internal logic of democracy, if that has changed. As you mentioned, democracy is about rule, and even ancient Greek philosophers, and when I say philosophers, I'm specifically talking about Plato and Aristotle. They conceived of democracy not as a good regime, but as a vice regime. In Aristotle in particular, it was the best, worst regime possible out of all the typologies of regime. He demonstrates this by saying that there are six different categories of rulerships. Polity and democracy are in exact opposition, and they're divided based on whether the people are ruling for their own self-interest or the interest of the common good. And for them, then people rule for their own benefit alone. In other words, they have their own benefit in mind only. The regime is vice, and that becomes a democratic regime. The same principle applies if there are a few ruling or there is one person ruling. Whereas today, when we talk about democracy, particularly in the West, we are talking about democracy as the only viable regime. Consider, for example, Fukuyama's end of history book, when he talks about liberalism and democracy, or the democratic peace theory that's very prevalent in international relations. Even if we don't want to go to academia and we can just look to politics itself, previous wars have been fought in order to export democracy into regimes that our democracy itself is foreign to whether it's a war in the Middle East or other parts of the world. Now, the question of Pericles is interesting. 
Thucydides talks very highly of Pericles, Thucydides being the historian who wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War. For him, and Mary Nichols, in her excellent book, analyzes the Thucydidean understanding of democracy, not just his, but also through his understanding of Pericles. She suggests, and I think there is good evidence to prove this, that Thucydides and Pericles both saw something very, very vicious in this natural primordial elements that democracy brings about. And Thucydides himself seemed to be much more, at least in his writing, forgiving of the Spartan regime than of the Athenian democratic regime. Great examples to demonstrate this point is when Pericles goes and talks to the Athenians when they are trying to effectively pin the plague that has come about Athens that's killing millions to Pericles and say, it's your fault that we have this plague. Pericles' response is quite devastating for them. And he says, perhaps the best demonstration of Nicole's claim to this is that when he says, here's the thing, your regime, your empire is built around despotism. And if you stop expanding the regime, other regimes that you have brought under your rule, effectively will rebel. So now you have very little choice. And furthermore, once Pericles, after being fined, because the speech itself wasn't enough to alleviate the anger of the Athenian felt towards him, despite it not being his fault, when he was voted to be the general, he becomes a lot more aristocratic in his rule. He's not ruling the Athenian in a democratic sense. In fact, a lot of times when Thucydides is discussing Pericles' rulership, he says he was not ruled by the people, but rather he ruled the people. And if you put that in opposition to what Lincoln said, rule of the people, for the people, by the people, they're in complete opposition to each other. So I think there's something interesting about that. And that's why the Athenian philosophers played on Aristotle again. were very, very hesitant to put democracy as the legitimate regime, because it brings out this primordial sense of constantly wanting to accumulate wealth. In the Athenian time, we don't practice this anymore. But in the Athenian time, when you go to war, you naturally manage to steal wealth, property, land, and you expand your empire. And you also gain honor. So this has become a very different regime of what we consider democracy. And that's because what happened, our understanding of democracy, and what changed throughout the history of Western democratic thought was the introduction of liberalism and liberty by thinkers like Thomas Hobbes indirectly and more directly by John Locke, where they came about and said, we don't necessarily need to subscribe to the way the Greeks thought about regimes, i.e. we are looking to the common good. We can build a system of politics where our own selfish desires can help us produce the best life possible. Hobbes, for example, doesn't talk about this directly, but he introduces the notion of consent into political discourse by having the Leviathan's power be rooted in the individual's consent. So he shifts the power from the community and the regime back to the people, which then they give up willingly. Locke, following Hobbes in some sense, and not entirely, but in some sense, Adopt that issue of consent. But whereas for Hobbes, for example, revolution was unjustifiable because you already consented, for Locke, revolution was perfectly justifiable precisely because of the consent and the social contract, where the regime is no longer abetting by what the contractors agreed to. Locke is perhaps the single greatest thinker of liberalism, sums in fact on the father of liberalism because he starts talking about liberty and toleration in a different sense. But here's the trick. When Locke and many people mistake this, they think that when Locke talks about freedom and liberty, he's talking about everything that it encompasses. And in some sense, they are right. But Locke has a very, very specific political project when he's talking about liberty. And that is the project of industrialization. He's very explicit about this. He says that as people leave what he calls the state of nature and move into civil society, we all can prosper together because now uncultivated land can be cultivated by individuals and owned as a property where others will start to work and then they become more and more wealthy. Now the arguments starting to sound more familiar to contemporary audience. These are the arguments you've heard before. 
for example, trickle-down economics is part of this. I, I believe it was Kennedy also. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it was Kennedy who said the rising tides makes everybody rise together. So when we are talking about democracy today, and we should be cognizant of this, we are talking about liberal democracy. And many democratic theories today work on that function, work on that premise and framework. Primary thinking in a Rawlsian terms about what we live today. So the interjection of liberty and into democracy produces different understanding of politics. Whereas, just as you said, democracy was about rulership. And the Greeks perfectly personify this for us by saying that there is an element of democracy where you rule externally. You rule the world around you. That requires a freedom for you to not be contained within a particular box. Whereas polity, a good regime where people are ruling themselves, is an internal condition when you rule your appetite rather than the external world exclusively. That also requires freedom. But with the interjection of liberalism, what we have now is not, as democracy would have us, freedom for the sake of rulership, but freedom for the sake of freedom itself. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with, as you said, theories about theories of democracy. Now that we're in today, I can't help but push you know, my sort of theoretical agenda here, me being someone who focuses my research on social media and such, because technology has always kind of been considered this thing throughout time that's been used to grapple and conquer the world around you. And when it comes to politics, technology has always been conceptualized as being this great leveler of citizenship, right? The thing that will create more legitimacy and popular sovereignty and democracy. How do you feel technology is impacting democracy today? That's a very interesting question, and I think it's a very timely question, particularly, as you said, within our own particular historical context. I was recently reading a book, and many of the material that I will mention, the book also talks about by Patrick Deneen called Why Liberalism Failed. Even though we are talking about democracy, I think he brings up a very interesting point about technology in our modern world. And if my endorsement is not enough, and this is what originally attracted me to the book, was that Barack Obama endorsed the book. On the back, he actually writes, this is one of the most important books of our time. So what we are talking about when we are talking about technology is interesting, because when we mention the word technology, we automatically think about technological innovations like cars, like computers, like Twitter, like Instagram. But what happens when we look at technology not as a material entity, but rather as a relational conditioning. That is how we relate to the world around us. This, some philosophers, uh, Heidegger, for example, talks about this. But what that does is that it produces a whole new world for us with respect to technology and analyzing our current condition. Patrick Denin talks about how today we are not forcing our regime to have technology at its disposal, but rather our technology is trying to have our regime at its disposal. What technology does, and as a relational concept, technology was originally conceived as a means of emancipation. We are meant to move away from the old constraints, whether they are spiritual, whether they are biological, whether they are environmental, whether they're distance or temporal even. Clock, for example, watches, for example, are meant as a way of compartmentalizing time, which then helps agriculture. So now you know how the weather would be or what time is noon, what time is early, when to wake up. So technology then becomes as a means of understanding the world as a means rather than as ends. What do I mean by that? I mean, when we look out into the world, we no longer see things for, for example, a tree being a beautiful tree, but rather we look at it as a thing which can give us efficiency and pleasure. And these pleasures usually are reduced to the base pleasures of body or what have you. So technology is not just the material thing, but rather the idea behind it. Locke, going back to him again, was perhaps one of the biggest philosophers in this way of thinking without even knowing it, or maybe he did. 
I wasn't in his head, and I'm not going to do psychoanalysis of Locke, but his primary political goal was to emancipate industrialization because he believed through industrialization we would alleviate a great deal of natural constraints which we have. So once these natural constraints are alleviated, we can be more and more free. This was in complete contradiction of the past in ancient Greek and medieval sense because they believe nature is part of our existence and our duty and responsibility is to live within it, not to control it. So when we have technology as emancipation, liberalism as freedom, and democracy and rulership all intermixed together, we get some very, very odd combinations. We see that today, technology, for example, is ruling our right in a sense we never considered before. The primary reason, for example, to give would be Patrick J. Zanin going back to the book when he's talking about the Amish. He says, we consider the Amish as backwards because they don't use technology, but that's our flaw of view. They are using technology, but before they use it, they ask, is this technology going to be conducive to achieving my end of life? Whereas today, we try to have technological innovation for further technological innovation. In this sense, democracy comes to be and rulership and freedom comes to be for the sake of technology itself. So what does that do to the promise originally made by technology for us to be free? Well, what happens when we extend this view not just to the natural world, but also to people? Then people themselves become resources for other individuals to be used for their own pleasure. Now, this might seem like a very, very far-fetched idea, but I would like to use a couple of examples here. One of them, the first one, is going to be completely anecdotal, but I think it demonstrates something. I was watching a YouTube video the other day, and I came across this video by accident, where this lady was talking about polyamory. And I was like, oh, interesting. I don't know anything about it. It might be interesting to watch, learn something. And she was explaining it to someone who was, I could, who was a kid, now, we leave the ethical and those type of questions aside for now. I mean, not even consider polyamory for a second. For her explanation of it and the context in which she used to explain it, she says, imagine you are in a restaurant. The other audience goes, yeah, I like restaurants. She goes, okay, do you want to go to the same restaurant over and over again? He goes, no, I like variety. He says, well, that's what it is like. It's like variety. You don't always want to eat hamburgers. One day you want to eat pizza. Now, this is a very, very de good demonstration of how we view people. They are like pizzas. One day I enjoy hanging out or having a relationship with this person. I love pizza, but I don't want to eat pizza every day. So I will move to hamburgers the next day. Now, what happens if you are in the opposite position? How would you feel if this person, as your significant other, will come to you and say, listen, I love you, and I genuinely do, but I feel like pizza today, so I'm going to hang out with this other person. You rightfully feel a bit offended because you go, I am an individual with agency, with a complex historical background. Why would I have to be reduced to a food? This is, one would say, well, you're just picking on this example. There are multiple examples. I can give another one. Seinfeld is an interesting example. He had a joke about uh, going to a movie theater. And I believe it was Mulane who brought this analysis. And I think he's very right in his analysis of this joke. Where Seinfeld goes, there is a sign on a movie theater where it says, please pick up your letter. And he goes, why? I left my letter. I pay. We are under understanding, under a contract, going back to social contract theory again. We are under an understanding, under this contract, that you rip me off, and then I get to litter. Thinking about that, and Maloney is right when he says this, thinking about that demonstrates a degree of viciousness towards other human beings, that we only view them as a cog. They're there to pick, af pick up after me. They're not people. They are cogs. Another example, perhaps this would be more familiar with American audiences who are living in Canada is when Canadians say thank you to the bus driver. I had this happen multiple times with people, my Canadian, my American friends are very surprised when I say thank you. 
And they go, what would you thank the bus driver? He did his job. I go, yes, but he did his job very good. And I think he deserves a thank you. He deserves an acknowledgement. The fact that he does his job doesn't exclude his humanity. And he's not his job exclusively. Today, we have institutions within every single other institution called the human resources. Now, whether what they do is good or bad, I live aside, but I just want to focus on the title. George Grant talks about this. He says it's a very odd title to say something is a human beings are a resource, as if to say they're bodies meant for administration rather than human beings. What that gets us is a technocratic society. Think about laws, for example. Laws are very complicated systems of regulations which are constantly trying to administer our lives in one way or shape or the other. Rights are written into laws in a way. So we are all universally affected by it. And yet we need a group of technocratic people who are familiarized with their language of the law to be able to defend other people's integral rights. It's incredibly interesting to see that I am subject to a law which I have access to through internet. And I can go and look it up, but no matter how many times I read it, I can't understand it. I need a specialized language to understand something that is so integral to my life as a citizen. So with this intermixing of democracy, freedom, rulership of liberalism, uh, freedom of liberalism, rulership of democracy, and emancipation of emancipation of our own natural limitations, let's say, to technology, we had a very interesting junction. How does this affect citizenship in total? You were told that with this, we have more access to information. With this technological innovations, we can vote easier. We can have more access to politics, and they're right. But what that means doesn't mean that we are now all at the same level. Technology managed to uproot the previously hold hierarchies, whether they were tribal, whether they are political, monarchical, whether they're clan-wise. Those hierarchies got uprooted. And because those hierarchies got uprooted, we automatically presumed, because those are uprooted, we are now equal. But what happened was that technology created its own version of hierarchy. A great example is where you have access to internet or how quick your internet is just to be able to go online. There has been a battle in the United States over the policy of internet regulations. So how far does that take us with technology and leveling? I would say we haven't really leveled the field with technology as much as we would like to think. Our lives have become a lot more efficient. But in the process, we have lost certain things. Politics is not a zero-sum game in a lot of sense. We gain something at the expense of another thing. And that has always been the case. So yes, with technology, we got great things like medicine. We got great things like a means of moving across the world. If I can't get a job in Canada, I probably can get a job in Europe somewhere. That is very emancipatory. But at the same time, our view also began to change. And we start to imposing different hierarchies. Locke, going back to him again, is very explicit about this as well. He says this is going to be emancipatory and everybody's going to be rising. But he's not an egalitarian. He very explicitly says, through the introduction of money into society, another form of technology, one could say, we are now ensuring inequality for time immemorial. So does technology level the field? I would say no. I would say technology enforces its own and reinforces its own way of hierarchy. Yeah, one thing that's tied to all this, I think, in a very intimate way, is the rise of you know contemporary populism. It's one of the things that affects any number of the elements of democratic quality, from citizenship to discourse to even party systems. While it's different around the world, it's always kind of predicated on this idea of exclusion. What are the roots of contemporary populism, in your view? How does it impact the strength of democracy today? So that is a very, very important and interesting question. First thing... I think we should keep in mind is that democracy as rulership, as the majority rule, as we generally understand it, does not include inclusivity. Inclusivity was rather a new concept, which, interesting enough, if you want to talk about good or bad side of the technology, depending on your view, was done primarily for the economic gain. We include people because we want more immigrants coming in to 
contribute to our economic benefit. And generally speaking, that has been the case. When you look at the direction of immigration, what we see is that those countries which are taking immigrants are generally speaking much more well off economically. So it does have a positive effect. They spend more money, if nothing else, by buying things and paying taxes on them. They're contributing to a pool, which then the citizens of that regime can use. So if you look at immigration as technology in that sense, and inclusivity, what we see also is that most inclusive societies are also the ones that are economically much better off. But democracy itself is not necessarily hostile to inclusivity or populism. In fact, sometimes democracies, particularly today in contemporary times, do become populist. And this was one of the fear of two of the perhaps greatest thinkers with democracy, John Stuart Mill and Tocqueville, where they discussed the dangers of populism as mass thinking and how to weed that off. So inclusivity was introduced to democracy relatively recent. Multiculturalism, as we know here in Canada, was not always part of our constitution. So what does this leave us with inclusivity, and how does, how does the root of it come about? Well, the root of it seems to be immigration and economic gain, which is, at, by the way, expensive of the countries where people are immigrating from. When we take, for example, not just immigrants, but also foreign students, we take foreign students in order for the students to come here and contribute to our education, our economy, and other things. But we get them at the expense of the country where they're coming from. That's a brilliant mind lost to them, our own gain. So what Tocqueville and John Stuart Mill say about this, and populism and inclusivity, is that in populism is inherently part of democracy, particularly today, as it was in ancient Greek. Mill and Topo are the result of what we call today the Western Enlightenment. And there was this faith in reason and how reason can help us make a better society if we just fully subscribe to it. So in fact, for Mill, people are inherently reasonable if they are exercising their faculty properly. And as, move for, as time moves forward through history, people's faculty gets more and more cultivated and they become more and more reasonable. But there needs to be a proper system in place for them to become reasonable. I know was an advocate of colonization because he said through colonization, we can bring reason to other nations. So this is how entrenched the concept of reason was for them, or we can make them more reasonable. But What's interesting is the question of the strength of democracy, because what do we mean by strength? And this is an important quality, which I think gets missed a lot of time when we're talking about democratic theory, particularly in the age of populism. Populism is not foreign to democracy. Democracy is about the rule of the people, by the people, for the people. So if the people want a demagogue, they will get the demagogue. And according to democratic rules, that is okay. But when you're talking about liberal democracies, now that is not so okay because that demagogue can reduce the freedom of other people. And that's where we get factions. And now we're becoming more and more factionless and more and more polarized. We can see this today in great in politics of other nations and how the notion of populism is giving rise to this uh, exclusionary approach to citizenry and rights, democracy doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily against this. But one thing that we should consider going forward is that how do you want, how do we as citizens want our regime to be? This is a sobering thought that we all need to have. We are all still continuing to be an active agent in politics. Politics is not necessarily set in stone. In fact, it's incredibly fragile. That means at all times we have to be very vigilant. It's how and where our politics is going, how our regime is going, how is it going to be manifesting in the future? Not everything is entirely out of our control. Furthermore, we should be conscious of how our politics is progressing, not necessarily towards a benevolent end. This was a progressive idea of history which was, as history moves forward, our society is getting better and better and better. And you probably and your audience probably have come across someone who asked them this question, do you have it better than your past parents? 
And generally people say, yes, we have it much better than our past parents. But is that really true? How do we measure that? It's just the faith in the idea that we are progressing towards a better world. Whereas if you history as a cyclical trend, as for example, Aristotle did, we have to look at politics of democracy and populism in democracy today, not necessarily as degradation of democracy or even as a backsliding, but I thought that must be very, very frightening for many people. This might be the next stage of our politics. And how can we remedy that? That's the key question. How do we make it the way we, how do we make a political regime which we can feel happy about, where we can feel as a collective happy in? And I think it goes back to the question of selfishness to many of us. Hamilton famously says we, have, we can have a political system where greed checks greed, or as he put it, self-interest checks self-interest. So we have, in the Hamiltonian case, built greed into our political system, which then bleeds into our society. Perhaps a deeper look internally for us can help us understand what it is that we really want from our politics. And to treat other people rather than as an end, but as a person, would help us better bring politics, which we all can be happy about. It's interesting, though, because despite everything that's been happening with, you know, you can point at the guys, Donald Trump is the most salient example. But I mean, Durate in the Philippines, Lukashenko in Belarus, we, we see these you know, patrimonialists, these guys who treat the government as their own piggy bank kind of show up and rule in a way that's quite nefarious. But there's also a pushback. Like when, when you were speaking, I couldn't help but think of the idea of a pendulum, right? And this plays a lot into the psychology of Jung, the idea that like we're ever just going between extremes. He talked about, I guess it was Apollo and Dionysius, but it's the idea of like, you know, Eros and Thanatos, right? The, uh, between constructiveness and destructiveness. And I really see, at least from my vantage point, amongst all this happening, like you see this pushback to make the pendulum go the other way. Greater understanding pushes for freedom. Is this sort of something new or do we always see this in, in democracies? I don't know if we see it always in democracies, because when we are again talking about democracies, each nation, according to its own cultural heritage, embodies democracy differently. Mm. But the pushback itself is interesting. The question is, how do we push back? And this has been part of the question that I've been asking myself a lot. How, how, what makes a pushback legitimate? If one adopts the techniques of its oppressor, is there a risk that the person becomes the oppressor eventually? And this is something that I myself struggle with. When the pushback, when the push is so strong, does the pushback become equally strong and how does it manifest itself? I think this is something that we should be very cautious of when we're talking about bringing a politics about. The first important element of any politics is an internal perspective where we know what we want as individuals and as a collective and where we want our politics to go to best represent us in that sense. So where does that leave us with Duarte and Donald Trump? Where? We have, well, we, we all have systems in place, we have institutions and voting to express ourselves. So the best approach, I think, is to mobilize grassroots movements to vote in accordance with the way you want them to vote. Not necessarily through propaganda and whatnot, but through dialogue and discourse. But the problem itself won't go away that easily. What happens if a demagogue leaves and a worse demagogue comes about three generations later, one generation later. That's something that we have to be cognizant of and we can't just change the regime into regime. We have to fix it on a grassroots level. And we can't do that until we view everybody as a person, not as a resource. So, you know, we began this talk addressing COVID because yeah, you're one of my besties. I miss you. I wish you were in this room with me right now. Same here. And, you know, COVID's it's impacted not just what we do, but the world at large immeasurably. Governments have met this challenge, you know, to some with acclaim. Others 
have not been able to meet its illustrated institutional clefts that need to be dealt with. And then at the same time, you have some that have explored this situation to undermine rights and citizenship and really use it as a means to expand their own power. In this sense, how has COVID impacted the state of democracy across the world? Unfortunately, I might not have the most satisfactory answer to this question <laughs> because it is undeniable that COVID has had a measurable impact currently on our political system. However, I believe that as the pandemic dies away, I am hesitant to give a time frame, but after the pandemic has moved away and we are now comfortable going back to what we would consider again normal, that's when we start to see the impact of this disease on our political system. Mm -hmm. And as a political scientist, I am very, very hesitant to start predicting the future because there are too many variables at play. So unfortunately, I will, yeah, I will eventually, I have to unfortunately leave that to the discretion of history and your listeners. And to say the best way that you can, if you feel like after COVID is done and the politics is not moving the way you want, become an active political player. And it doesn't necessarily need to be running for office. It can be something as simple as getting to know your neighborhood, helping your fellow uh, citizens, or just participating in town halls within your own community or form your own community. But we will see the effect of this disease after it's over. So thanks, Matt. So, so before we call it a quits here, I just want to know, and I'm sure the listeners are interested, what, what are you working on? Tell us a bit about your research and what you've been up to these days with it. I have been trying to research, originally my research primarily interest lies in ancient Greek political philosophy and medieval Islamic political philosophy. Recently, I have been trying to research how does Al-Farabi's political philosophy can be put in conversation with perhaps non-traditional Islam, not traditional philosophers where he's his dialogue has been taking place, particularly I've been looking at the works of David Hume and trying to engage, as Al Farabi himself teaches us, a dialogue between civilizations in some sense. Um, two drastically different people who probably didn't know about one another doing drastically different things, and yet very, very intellectually invigorating uh, text being put in dialogue in order to find some sort of uh, remedy for what I think would be the crisis of today, or rather what they would suggest our political system should do going forward. It's interesting. We've had this conversation before about just how in in the canon there's not enough consideration about those Middle Eastern Muslim philosophers, so it's really good to see someone taking that on. Yeah, there are, there are not enough considerations, but as I am getting more and more into it, I see there are hidden gems here and there uh, who are working on this stuff and they have some very interesting work. So this is the interesting part when something is not worked on as in-depthly as one would like, the new stuff that are coming out becomes very interesting and very invigorating to engage. So yes, it's, it is an unfortunate, but at the same time, fortunate accident. Ali, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this stuff with us. It's it's really important, and you bring perspective, which I think is missing. Thank you for having me. I hope your listeners have enjoyed this conversation. If I were to leave on any note, I would say be kind to each other and try to make the best of the worst situation. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure to follow us on social media. You can find us on Twitter at cu underscore poli sci on Instagram at cu underscore poly dot sci, and on Facebook at carltonu dot poly sci.